Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to this session, uh, Digital Resilience, what to do when the internet goes down. And our four attendees today are Goda Benjamin, uh, Jin Fu Xiang, Li Wen, and I'm Irving Chen. Also thanks Zhi Hao for organizing this session and bring us all here. Uh, digital res resilience refers to the ability of digital systems to not break or to quickly restore or re recover from natural disaster, accidental, extent, and malicious attack. And today we have the top Wi-Fi here at Sinica at, at, at the summit from ClickClick. Click. And I bet all of you have like a unlimited 5G connection as a backup plan. So if the Wi-Fi here goes down, we can still uh, do in presentation, uh, write HackMD, or asking questions at Slido. And I hope that you all have the presentation on the, on the thumbnails. Yeah, if the like, Wi-Fi goes down, <laughs> we may uh, rely, rely on that. But uh, are we resilient enough to a scenario that if the whole Taiwan goes offline from the global internet, our whole island depends on like almost uh, about 20 uh, submarine cables connecting and four coal stations to connect us to the whole, uh, to, the, to the global. And they are very easy to break due to like national disasters, uh, like undersea ocean, uh, undersea earthquake, tall fishing vessels, and accident, accidents from our like friendly neighbor, like fishing ships or like sand pumping ships. On like last February 2023, as an example, two cables connecting Taiwan to Mazu, one of our islands, uh, remote islands, break in less than two weeks. So that, that damaged the internet for the 13,000 residents of that I, or on that island for almost 50 days. And later, Li Wen will share in, will tell us more about how they survive without in that two months, without line, full panda, or Facebook, or even TikTok. Yeah. And in Ukraine, uh, in Ukraine, uh, they have like Starlinks to keep connecting and to like stand against Russia's attack on their telecommunication infrastructure. But I personally have no faith on the businessman who just flew to China last week to beg for the emperor's mercy. So they are considered like one to 100 in the score. What will you score to the level of the digital resilience of our country and our like daily life? And now, and what can we do to strengthen and to prepare for the day when the internet is down, if they are one day and in, in this GAP Zero, GAP Zero Summit session, we are honored to invite Goda, the SS Now Asia Pacific campaigner, to share with us about how people in Myanmar uh, help each other and maintain connecting during internet shutdowns. And Li Wen from Mazu, who will like sharing their experience during the internet outages, and Jin Fu Xiang, from here, Academy Sinica, the uh, Institute of uh, Information Science, to share that uh, the of, of grid communication technology that the local community, the civil tech communities, is exploring to address those internet issues. And each of us will have 20 minutes. And we will have like a, another 20 minutes for the QA altogether at the, at the end. So during the present, Please ask in the question on the Slido, which you can find the, the link there. And you can also collaborate in writing the, the, the notes on the HackMD. And both links will, will available, uh, also available from the websites of the Summit, from the Gongbi in the Summit website. So if you can access them later. OK, and here I will give the floor to Goda as the beginning. Thank you so much, and thank you, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. Again, my name is Golda Benjamin. I'm the Asia-Pacific campaigner of Access Now. To those who were here 
prior to this session. Uh, those were my colleagues as well. So I'm happy to start my presentation with a brief introduction of Access Now for those who were not here in the previous session. Um, Access Now is an international NGO working to defend and extend the digital rights of people and communities at risk. Uh, right now, our global team has over 130 members. We're spread out in about 20 countries around the world. So we're quite huge, but the problems are also bigger uh, than our team. Um, our work uh, is multi-pronged. We work with government. We also engage with companies. And of course, we work with civil society and communities around the world to work on old and new issues surrounding uh, fundamental human rights in the digital, right, uh, in the di digital space. And from the session a while ago, we also run an all-day, 24-7 digital security helpline that supports journalists at risk and activists at risk uh, facing problems like surveillance and spyware, account compromises, doxing, and other attacks online. And of course, we convene the Keep It On campaign. We monitor and push back against internet shutdowns around the world. And this is going to be the framework of my story today on internet shutdowns in Myanmar and what we can potentially do as a community. Uh, I'm not from Myanmar, and I'd like to take this opportunity to recognize the struggles of the people of and in Myanmar who continue to be unable to join us in many conferences because of what their country is facing. And so I feel very privileged and honored to bring their stories and to tell their stories to this room today. So these are the stories in Myanmar. Can we go to the previous slide? This is the severity of the internet shutdown in Myanmar. This is a report from our 2022 Keep It On report, and I'd like to take this opportunity to also share that hopefully by the end of May, we're going to release our next Keep It On report with data including uh, data uh, from Taiwan. So in Myanmar, internet shutdowns are really prolonged some lasting for 540 to 600, 700 days. So more than one year of internet shutdowns. Our latest data also show that out of 14 regions in the country, 13 have experienced internet shutdowns. And of all the internet shutdowns recorded in the country, 11 are connected to severe human rights violations. What does this mean? This means that the, shut, the internet shutdowns usually happen before bombings of villages and communities, before the military burns entire villages, including places of worship and places where people earn a living, like markets, and the military would shut down the internet to prevent people from preparing for these attacks and then recovering from these attacks. Shutdowns in Myanmar are also worsening because early on in the last few years, the orders came from central government, so it was easier to trace and document. But in 2023, it seems that shutdown orders have become more localized. So in the provinces, it seems that there are authorities that are able to shut down the internet really fast and for the military to use the internet to achieve military objectives. So for many of us, losing internet is an inconvenience, but for those who continue to live in Myanmar, losing the internet means that the internet is being weaponized. It is used as a weapon against their exercise of their fundamental rights and even their capacity to live and survive in such hostile environments. 
And so how are people coping? They do their best, but it is not enough. So people are communicating through walkie-talkies or two-way radios, which looking around the room today, I'm sure many of you have not even held walkie-talkies. And they use that to communicate. Of course, the range is very short. They can only probably uh, talk. The one that I've used so far, uh, and it's easily accessible, is around 200 meters. And so it's not much. Some of them do use like range extenders, uh, but also extending very low, uh, low internet access, 2G or even lower. Uh, our partners on the ground even tell us they cannot even send one picture because the internet speed is so low. Um, we've heard of some groups that are able to access satellite, satellite connection, but of course, because Myanmar is um, in a state of war and the, the economy is falling, of course, it's also very expensive. And there is also a legal problem. For some satellite services, these are not officially authorized in the country. So it's difficult for them to use these services. And that's the challenge that I also want to share with you in the form of a story, because I am in a room of people with innovation and activism in their hearts, uh, hoping to come together to find real world solutions for these extreme problems in Myanmar. And that's one piece of our call for the country and hoping also that the lessons of Myanmar and in Myanmar, we can use as a community of activists to prepare our own communities to make our own communities resilient in the face of growing internet shutdowns around the world, being weaponized by authoritarian uh, countries and also tech companies that are so easily captured by authoritarian uh, leadership so that they just follow internet shutdown orders. And I hope that this community uh, will come together also to push back against this model of doing things. So in Myanmar, Access Now, together with the voices and the power of the digital rights community and the human rights community of Myanmar, have this call to the global community, that we are hoping that we establish and commit resources for a coordinated action plan. And resources could be financial resources, technical resources and technical knowledge, and even policy, policy support, in order to provide the people of Myanmar with alternative access to the internet and other communication channels. And not just in the form of humanitarian aid, but as something that we should recognize as critical for protecting lives and fundamental human rights. In the previous section, in the previous session my colleagues were asked if what we think about promoting uh, the right to internet as a, as a fundamental human right. And my colleague said that um, it's strategic for us to recognize it as an enabler of human right. Because now we might call it as internet, but in the future it could be called another thing. But at the end of the day, it's our right to speak and to speak freely. And we hope that we can all come together as a community uh, to come up with a coordinated action plan, financial, technology, policy, uh, to address this growing problem, not just in Myanmar, but in many of the countries where we operate. And so uh, I have left my, our uh, website here and also my personal um, email, uh, my work email, because we are always we always feel privileged to be able to sit and speak in conferences like this one so that we can connect with the community that we work with so that we can continue evolving ideas to help those who need it the most. And so thank you so much for the invitation. Okay, thank, thank you, Goda, for sharing the situations in Myanmar. Um, we, we next, next, we will handle the 
the the floor to the one who 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 also like have the similar like experience, maybe not that similar, a slightly like experience on when the internet goes down. Uh, yeah, yeah, can uh, All right. Um, thank you, Ervin, and uh, let's see if they can resolve that. It's a PDF file. Yeah. I think that can work. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's yeah. okay. Yeah, and you can find the next page works. Oh, yeah, yeah I yeah, think that's okay. It works. Then we will have some like <laughs> preview yeah. for that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you get a slight preview, a sneak preview for that. Okay. Uh, uh, thank, thanks again, Irvin, for inviting me to attend this uh, session. And it's great to have this opportunity to share our experiences and um, thoughts about uh, with so many experts and analysts on digital res resilience. Um, so uh, my name is Wen, and I'm from the Department of International Affairs at the Democratic Progressive Party. Um, during the incident that Irvin just mentioned earlier, um, when the two submarine cables connecting Taipei to Matsu were damaged by Chinese fishing vessels and cargo vessels last year between February and uh, up until the end of uh, March. So I was mostly in the Matsu Islands as a t at the time as a resident. And so, so I experienced fully the, the entire length of the incident, including the experiences of residents, its impact on the local economy. And uh, I followed closely the flurry of uh, conversations and dialogues that were sparked by the incident, including international attention, including um, a lot of uh, policy discussions on how to increase Taiwan's digital resilience, on how to better strengthen Taiwan's communications security. And um, so there were many po policy implications and many dialogues that stemmed from this, um, this incident in Matsu. And so in this presentation, I'm going to talk about these policy implications, but also I will also share my personal experiences as a victim of uh, this particular incident in which uh, we as residents lost uh, full access to the internet and how it affected our lives. So to give a brief recap of this incident, uh, there are two submarine cables connecting the Matsu Islands to Taipei. And the Matsu Islands are around 200 kilometers away from northern Taiwan, separated by the Taiwan Strait. So in February 2nd, on February 2nd, uh, one of these cables were broken by a Chinese fish, fishing vessel. And on February 8th last year, the second cable was damaged by a Chinese cargo boat, which dropped its anchor exactly on one of the cables. And this left us with extremely limited internet access. Um, by limited, I mean that uh, there was still partial access as in there was a backup system that kicked in right away. It's called a microwave transmission backup system. However, it was extremely limited. It provided a weak signal that was not adequate for most of the residents for Matsu. So, for example, even though we had access to the backup signal, sending a message by Facebook Messenger or line would take around 20 to 30 minutes. So it was basically virtually a complete a near complete cutoff of the internet. And so there were a lot of discussions that followed after the incident happened in Matsu. And I think a lot of these discussions revolved around the idea of increasing redundancy, redundancy, and more redundancy. The importance of providing backup solutions to all our communications channels in case uh, in the case where one of them falters or uh, when, when any one particular communication channel fails to function smoothly. So we can see this multi-layered approach that uh, a lot of policymakers have been discussing. So under sea, we need increased submarine cables uh, between Matsu and the main island or uh, between Taiwan and the rest of the world. Uh, on the ground, we we need better microwave transmission systems. And uh, several ministries have been uh, 
devoting a lot of efforts on increasing the capabilities and the bandwidth for the microwave transmission systems, um, such as the one we have in Yangmingshan next to Taipei, which broadcasts the signal to Matsu. And uh, uh, a third layer would be outer space. So that includes the low-orbit satellites, the mid-orbit satellites that Taiwan has uh, an ongoing domestic program, um, and, and all these other um, outer, outer space solutions that uh, the government is currently working on, along with the private sector. So this is a multi-layered approach to ensure that we have different options of communications in the case of a contingency or emergency. Um, uh, just some ad additional information about myself. My name is Wen Li. I'm currently the Director of International Affairs at the DPP. And between 2020 to 2024, I lived in Matsu around 45 years um, as uh, the director of the local chapter, the local office in the Matsu Islands. So we've been encountering a lot of, uh, we could say, potential gray zone activities or gray zone threats uh, in, on the maritime sphere coming in from China. So Chinese fishing vessels, Chinese sand dredgers uh, that, that could pose a threat to our infrastructure and our environment or our fishing industries as well. And to, to so when I, when I recall, when I try to remember this, uh, the 50 days in Matsu when, when the incident just happened. So I remember when, so when the, when the cables, when the first cable broke on February the 2nd, not many people noticed it because the two cables provide backup to each other. So when one of the cables broke, we still had the other cable. And nobody, not, not that many people, people noticed, people continued using the internet. Perhaps some of us saw the news or some information about one of the cables breaking, but not that many people discussed the incident. Um, but on February 8th, when the second cable broke, that's when the internet largely went down. And uh, so, it created an enormous impact on people's lives. Um, it's not just about losing access to YouTube or Netflix. It's not just about no longer being able, being able to watch funny videos. It, it's about a complete restructuring of economic activities and social activities and uh, professional activities as well. So it largely infected, impacted the local tourism industry. It impacted um, administration and government agencies and it disrupted logistics too in many ways, including the plane tickets or the shift, the, uh, the ferry tickets that people have to buy, or the hotel reservations, or uh, the materials for shipments and orders from e-commerce or any type of uh, simple logistics. Since the daily lives of, particular, uh, of basically every industry in, in the modern, modern era just relies so much on internet access. And, this just created a huge disruption. And uh, so one of the things that, um, uh, that Chonghua Telecom, which is the only major uh, telecom company based in Matsu, uh, that has services, more services in Matsu, is that, so Chonghua Telecom set up Wi-Fi hotspots on a 24-hour aspect, uh, at, on a 24-hour basis. And these Wi-Fi hotspots became the hottest places in town. They, they, uh, so people gathered in the Chonghua Telecom offices during the day to use the free Wi-Fi. And at night, I actually took this photo on the right here. So I was in my car and I drove to out, just right outside the Zhonghua Telecom building to link my phone up to the Wi-Fi signal. And so it was like a drive-through service and people gathered outside of uh, the, the Zhonghua Telecom offices in the middle of the night. And so what, what happened is that when you have a limited backup signal, the telecom company or the government agencies gets preferential bandwidth or preferential access. So it becomes an uneven access to the internet. So, so I, I recall that many military agencies or government agencies would receive the transmitted signals from Yangmingshan, from the mountain in Taipei to Matsu, and they would receive the preferential bandwidth, which, which is sort of understandable, but as civilians living on the, as residents living on the islands, that meant we needed to head over to the telecom offices and gather around these specific locations or spots, or, or some people would ask friends who were, were working inside the government to, to beg them for a little, um, <coughs> some, some, uh, a, a, a little time to use the internet, to share the internet with them. 
Yeah, and, and so, so that's, that's what happened. And when you think back about it, it was quite surreal to have all these people in the middle of the night gathering outside a telecom office. And so, so there was a huge impact for the Matsu tourism industry. Uh, Matsu relies on hotel, the hotel industry, a lot of BMBs and small scale hotels. Uh, the hotel owners couldn't get their reservations online. Many tourists didn't want to come visit Matsu because there was no access to internet. <laughs> and uh, the restaurants uh, and the small businesses, the shop owners were also affected on a large scale. And this was a process since when the incident happened in February, the bandwidth for Matsu, for an entire Matsu was around 2.2 gigabytes per second. That, that was the bandwidth that the microwave transmission station could provide for Matsu, 2.2 Gbps. But, and for the entire population of Matsu, the internet usage was around eight to 10 Gbps. Uh, Matsu is not a really large place. It ha we have a population of around 10,000 people. So, so the, the initial bandwidth was not quite enough. And so when the incident happened in February and uh, the Ministry of Communications and Min Digital Minist Ministry started improving the microwave transmission system. And in March, they increased the microwave transmission system to around like 3.6 Gbps, which meant instead of waiting for 20 minutes for sending a line message, we only had to wait for like five minutes or 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah. so, so it was a slowly improving process throughout those 50 days. And uh, these are photos of the microwave transmission system. Uh, the, the one on the right is in Yamingshan, and the one on the left is in Dongying Island, which is one of, the, uh, one of the islands located a little bit closer to the center of the Taiwan Strait. So it was a gradual process, but however, by December last year, the bandwidth was increased to 10.6 Gbps, which means that in the future, if a similar incident occurs for Matsu again, then the residents will continue to have access of, to the internet that's close to the normal speed for our uh, usual internet access. But again, this is only for Matsu. So it also begs the question about what uh, Taiwan would do if Taiwan as an entire country encountered a similar scenario in which uh, our 15 to 20 international submarine cables were damaged, and the entire nation would have to provide backup signals through, I would assume, a satellite connection, since a microwave transmission system would definitely not be able to provide adequate bandwidth for an entire country of 23 million people. So, 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 so these are just many, there, there's just a tremendous amount of uh, policy questions that remain to be answered. Um, another, another measure that the ministries partook in is the construction of an additional submarine cable. So instead of two submarine cables, by the year 2025, Matsu would have three submarine cables <laughs> that provide backup to each other um, by the year 2025. And then we have the mid-orbit satellites that Taiwan is producing domestically. And uh, uh, the Ministry of Digital Affairs has uh, started working on 700 of these testing sites across the country, mostly in remote areas of the country. And Matsu was chosen as the first testing site among these 700 locations. And I think I took this photo around, around April or May last year. So right after the submarine cable incident. Um, and following the incident, our digital minister, Audrey Tang, visited uh, a low earth orbit satellite company in the UK called OneWeb. And I think, I believe um, uh, the, these ministries are engaging in conversations with many countries, uh, with many companies across the world, based in the UK, based in Canada, based in other countries. Um, and so the idea is to provide more options and more, uh, more redundancy, more, more backup uh, options and choices for Taiwan's uh, satellite connections, communications. Redundancy, redundancy, and more redundancy. Um, some related issues that I would like to discuss. Uh, one is the row of Chinese sand dredgers, which are illegal sand mining ships that operate uh, close to 
Matsu and Jinmen and, and even close to the center of the Taiwan Strait near the Penghu Islands. And uh, these sand dredgers peaked around the year 2020, in which when we looked at the coast of Matsu, we used to be able to see around 100 to 200 of these illegal sand mining ships right outside the publicly announced waters of Matsu. So not that many ships actually entered our so-called restricted waters. Um, that's, the, that's the zone for our Coast Guard operations. So not that many of the sand dredgers actually entered, but some of them did, and some of them were detained and arrested by our Coast Guards. Uh, so so they, re they peaked in number around the year 2020, but they later decreased in numbers, partly because of the international attention from the international media. A lot of uh, international journalists flew in to cover the phenomenon of our islands getting surrounded by Chinese sand dredgers, and uh, also partly because Taiwan enacted really harsh penalties in monetary fines or jail sentences for illegal sand mining, which includes both domestic illegal sand mining and foreign illegal sand mining. So I think the legal measures are a very important component to, this, to these conversations. Um, so the sand dredgers, they destroy the marine habitat, uh, they suck up the sand and they bring it back to China to, 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 do, to engage in um, land reclamation projects or large-scale infrastructure projects. Uh, so so you, you, these are pictures of, taken from, from airplanes, you'd see like hundreds of the sand dredgers back in t the year 2020. Uh, they have decreased largely in number, so um, by, by last year you would only see like five to ten of them operating in small groups. But it also, they also led to damages for our submarine cables. And what happens is that sometimes the sand dredgers don't directly don't directly touch upon these cables. They don't directly uh, poke at the cables with the sand dredging equipment. But what happens is that when the cables are exposed on the seabed because of a lack of sand to cover them, then they are really easily damaged by other ships, such as bottom trawling fishing nets or um, cargo ships, which can easily hit the submarine cables by using anchors or other equipment. And so you see this chart that between 2017 to 2024, the cables were damaged um, over 30 times. But most of these instances went unnoticed because the two cables provide backup to each other, as I mentioned. So when only one cable breaks, the other cable continues to provide communications for Matsu, and nobody really gives, pays that much attention to the incident. So, so this has been repeatedly occurring over the past five to six years, and you see this chart in which it lists around one third of the ruptures were caused by sand dredgers, and another third by fishing vessels, and another third by cargo vessels. Um, another issue I would like to address is that it takes a tremendous amount of time simply waiting for the, for the repair vessels to come to Taiwan to repair our vessels. And that's because Taiwan does not own our own submarine cable repair ships. So for example, the ship that came to repair our submarine cables is ba usually based in Singapore. And uh, these are large, really extremely expensive ships and, high, uh, and they are usually, they, these privately owned ships signed contracts with many different countries, including the public sector and uh, private telecom companies. So whenever there's an incident, we actually have to wait for this um, repair ship to finish its repairs in many other parts of the world, traveling around <laughs> the seas and traveling around to different countries before they can uh, arrive in Matsu or, or other parts of Taiwan to engage in these repairs. And it's extremely time consuming. And this, uh, with, with new, um, I guess with new uh, geopolitical th circumstances, many academics around the world and think tanks are already discussing for the need for many um, individual countries to prioritize investment in submarine cable repair ships uh, when we're faced with uh, a, a drastically different geopolitical environment compared to the 1990s when most of these telecom uh, submarine cables were built. So, so we've seen interest and inquiries about the Matsu incident from a lot of scholars in Northern Europe or the Baltic countries where 
where, where European countries have also had concerns about uh, Russian vessels damaging European submarine cables. And so a lot of discussions going on here in this front. Uh, we can see that Taiwan heavily re relies on around 14 to 20 uh, international submarine cables that connect Taiwan with Japan, with the Philippines, with Hawaii, with Hong Kong, and even with China. Uh, but, but, but it also begs the question about whether these submarine cables are adequately protected. And also given the fact that these cables are connected to land through only three landing stations, two in northern Taiwan and one in the south southern part of Taiwan. And so these are vulnerabilities that we also have to address. Uh, last year, following the Matsu incident, there, the Taiwan's parliament passed an amendment to the Telecommunications Management Act, which led to hard, increased fines and jail sentences for people who damage either the submarine cables or the landing stations. So we, we can see pretty harsh sentences, like sentences of up to, jail sentences of up, up to seven years and a 10 million NT dollar fine. And it, there are also harsher sentences for uh, damages to the cables if they led to further disasters or the further uh, loss of human lives. So it could be mean a lifetime imprisonment. So there are discussions going on on the legal front, but I think perhaps more can be done and I would welcome any suggestions. Uh, so, so just a slew of questions. So many questions remain unanswered. So how can we adequately protect the cables? How do we fix the cables faster? Um, do we need a, a repair ship of our, of our own? Um, uh, what, ba what other backup systems do we have, ranging from mid-orbit satellites to lower or lower Earth orbit satellites? And what legal protections can we offer? Uh, and then we have the, the general backdrop of a geopolitical structuring, restructuring of um, technology in general and communications channels in, in general where we have a restructuring of supply chains and technology, technology products. So, in conclusion, many questions, but, but, but <laughs> we look forward to increased international cooperation and international assistance from our fellow democracies and friends across the world to uh, strengthen Taiwan's communications resiliency. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks, Li Wen, for sharing the experience and so many like, points that we need to like, address. Like if any if anybody is like haven't imagined a scenario that the whole Taiwan goes down, if the whole Taiwan goes down, how can you maintain your business, maintain your company, or maintain your like services, uh, maintain a connection to the to the to your friends, to your families? Then it's time to start to think about it. How how to keep it, and then. Um, I think that uh, uh, maybe at, at that time we need to gather in outside of Sufabu and using their Wi-Fi signals like Mazu or like or, or like uh, all the government like <laughs> department and using their signals because uh, we don't have our own like satellite systems. We only have very limited like open access to one web or to like other companies who will come in in the, in ne in later like few months is maybe there will be second companies come in but yeah that that's so big issues of like weaponize the internet shutdown now not only from the government from the military but also from our like our like the 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 foreign neighbors to to use that as the weapon to I can imagine that when the when the internet is down there will be like uh, people in Mazu asking why we just why we don't just like connecting to China just build a cable to China. They're so that's much close, and maybe it it will be much easy, much uh, withstands for the much like strengthen and not easy to break. Yeah. So the the weaponized of the internet shutdown is like uh, the very latest uh, like issues that the, the global communities need to address, and maybe we really need uh, our own like submarine cable repair ships. I believe that's much easier than like building our own satellite systems, which uh, Suwabu is discussing a lot. Yeah, but uh, some main cable, if it, I, I know it's expensive, but it won't be expensive than building the satellite system. Yeah, so maybe we really need that. Because you can see that uh, we, will, we, will, we will need to wait to until 2025 for the third cable from Mazu to Taiwan to be like, operating. And that, that's next year. And if the 
if the Taiwan uh, all all submarine cables connecting Taiwan is break, should we need uh, waiting for like two years to, for for the cables to rebuild? So that yeah, maybe that's one of our like, very potential abilities that we need to have. And okay, and next we'll, we will let uh, Shang sharing the how what the civil society the, the our like civil communities is like exp experiment or exploring. Now, if the internet really goes down, and how can we maintaining our like domestic communications? And let's give the floor to Shang. So, well, hi, uh, uh, hello everyone, and good afternoon. I'm Sean, and well, I'm. Sorry, I thought that this will be a, like a Mandarin talk, but since everyone is using English, I will be using English. But sorry for the slides, it's still Mandarin. And okay, so let's start it. So this is me, I'm Sean, and I'm actually uh, from Seneca, and I, I, I'm a research assistant at uh, our information and science department. And actually, I do a lot of weird things. I kind of like know everything just a bit, or if, just enough to like make me feel good or something like that. So I built for a lot of weird things. And, and actually, I, oh, I, I join a, a lot of community. I go to a lot of, uh, from Sitcom, Coast Cup, or actually uh, G, 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 A, the GDMV. Yeah, and that's me. And this is my professor, and this uh, is Dr. Chen. And he's the reason why we, I'm allowed to do a lot of uh, this stuff, and he's actually the uh, uh, head of the Internet Service uh, Internet Service Department of Seneca, and a professor from NTNU or something. Like that. And yeah, and we the project we we have done before is called Airbox. So we put air like air quality sensors all over Taiwan, like a thousand, uh, ten thousand of them, and. We have a little, um, little well, not little, but we have the actually community or Facebook group called Last Location Aware Sensing System. Maybe some, someone you know of it. So, and this is our lab. So, it's uh, computer science and communication laboratory. So we actually do like IoT things and like uh, civil science and. Uh, we do a lot of sensor. Actually, we just put a lot of weird sensors, PM 2.5, water sensors, uh, noise sensor, everything to everywhere, and just collect the data. And <clears throat> the things that's interesting is, is we do actually every part. So we design the hardware, and we find a way to transmit the data back. We actually analyze and store, actually know how to use those data. So we have a lot of toys, so if you are Interesting, we're always short on, on people. <clears throat> okay, let's start, get started. And so this is what our, um, my talk will go through. So how do we start, what do we do, how's the effect or how does it work, and how's the community grows, and what we are going to do next. So, <clears throat> sorry. I haven't talked for a while, so yeah, sorry for that. Um, so, yeah, a little, bit, a little background for when, before everything started. So, because of the Airbox pro uh, the project, we actually, we ha actually, me, I go to every, like, every cities, every place is in Taiwan, and actually we just build and deploy sensors in every uh, middle school and elementary school. And those, every, there's a lot of, Places and every uh, like weird place, you have to put the sensor. Sometimes it doesn't really have uh, electric uh, power. It doesn't really have uh, internet. So uh, we spend a lot of time to figure out how to transmit data back. So we have tried radio. We have tried LoRa. We tried Sigfox, MBLT, a lot of weird because well, Taiwan is pretty convenient. You can have like 4G and Wi-Fi like everywhere, but well. It's power consumption, pretty well, power hungry, and actually it's pretty expensive. So when we are building like low cost sensors, we don't really have that much budget and actually don't have that power. So we have to tend to find solutions that like can do like long range, but cost, uh, price, uh, well, cost effective. So, and also we do, uh, we make some device and actually device that actually moves or actually uh, we can just bring it everywhere to measure or do every weird things. 
So here's how we started. So back in like 2020 and 2021, there's like, there's like a huge earthquake. Well, every year has a huge earthquake, but uh, there's a like pretty huge earthquake in Hualien. And I think the most memorable things is our generator stopped. So everyone in Taipei, actually in, in whole Taiwan, our, the power is cut off for like two days or three days. And in 2022, we have uh, another big earthquake, the uh, Rus uh, Ukraine Russian war. 2023, we have, uh, yeah, we, our cable broke. The Turkish, uh, they, have, they have a really, really huge earthquake. And, and we have a flooding, I think, sometime in, in maybe mid year, I forgot. So the civil right and actually disaster and actually the, the issue started to, well, before like 2020, actually no one really cares about this kinds of topic because we don't think everything will go to heaven. And actually no one, act, there's not a, a disaster that like we have to like go through uh, assembly in a shelter or something like that. We never have done, we have done the practice or exercise before, but not actually, yeah, Taiwan is pretty safe and we doesn't really have that threat or that. So, when the disaster happens, the most concerned thing is the power and communication. So once at the start, we're just thinking, okay, we have the sensors everywhere. We make sensors, everything is made of us. So we just, and because uh, when disaster happens, when there's power loss, whereas there's a communication uh, uh, disconnected, uh, people tend not to prepare everything. So you probably don't know where is the near, uh, nearest shelter, like, actually near the car. I mean, I'm, being, I'm here for like six years, I still don't know where is the nearest, uh, nearest shelter for earthquake or, uh, or, or something else. But yeah, so we always start to look for information since the disaster happens. But when that happens, you don't have, uh, don't have power, don't have connection. It's, just too slow, so it's, you can't get access for internet and you don't know where you are, you don't know where to go, you don't know uh, whether the hospital, uh, whether the shelter, whether you don't know everything. So our first idea is, okay, so we have like um, sensor everywhere. So those sensors, normally they just are collecting environmental data, doing things they are do, supposed to do, but we, actually stores some offline maps or it stores the uh, recent their aerial photos or satellite photos and we stores uh, maybe uh, the hospital uh, the actually the local offline map and and where uh, where to gather the instruction for those things so you don't really need to prepare everything in your phone you just go to the gather point and we actually provide you the ex well everything from that local node because it's a Raspberry Pi, so we can actually share it, uh, actually turn it to a uh, Wi-Fi hotspot. Once you connect to it, you can download a PDF uh, instruction how to do, I mean, do first aid or actually where to go, everything you should need, where to gather, where is the fire department, everything in that. So that's the first idea, but it sounds good. And actually we have a lot of, actually, because we're uh, deploying the device in, at many school, so they are pretty sparse, actually pretty even. But it doesn't work, so it's not really effective, it's not fun, and it's, it, well, it's not fun, because that's pretty obvious, because everything I saw can be, I mean, you are, actually there's a lot of guys like writing code, or, you know probably how to do those things, or actually it's just gathering data, and it's get, gathering organized, it doesn't really have, any innovation or I don't really solve anything. And for the past like 10 or 15 years, I don't really have experience like actually going to the gathering port. So it doesn't really do much. So it's a good idea, but it didn't solve anything. So next we say, okay, um, what can we do next? So maybe we can let, make those stations or make those sensors like talk to each other without the current like uh, 4G network or cell camera, just talk to, talk to them each other. So we started the project called the Disaster Emergency something, I don't know, and 
actually, I don't, I'm bad at names, so I didn't set up those names. So yeah, I don't even know there's an English version of it, so sorry. And so the main good purpose is, okay, we have to find a way to have a well stay connected or actually have the communication ability when there's a disaster. So to make sure, uh, maybe you can't watch uh, YouTube or Netflix 4 ks with low systems, but at least you can actually send message to your friends, your family, and you can say, okay, I'm here, I'm in this location. I can actually guide or actually provide routes for some uh, certain environments. And yeah, and we tend to like use what we have right now uh, because there, if we are going to invent new things and everything, we can have a like super network. Well, on paper it works, but there it takes like a decades and a huge amount of resource to make it. So we don't really have that, actually have that access or uh, uh, that resource to do that. So the costs have to be relatively low. So the basic problem what we actually go through is, uh, or actually the scenario is, and when this system will work, we need to work when the uh, basic communication is fa has failed. So basically no cell phone network and you have limited power and maybe it's in the mountain area or there's just no uh, cell phone station. And our goal has to be, the system has to do like long range communica uh, uh, communication capability or now, yeah, and have enough bandwidth. So maybe you have to, you can transmit some kind of data or some kind of package. And the power consumption need to be low and uh, where I run some batteries uh, until the actually the power and the communication come back. Well, the, uh, uh, actually Zhonghua Telecom and actually uh, the power company in Taidian. So they are pretty fast on fixing stuff. So, I mean, you don't really experience like a large long time like outbreak of, or disconnect in like 10 years, I think. So we don't need to have a like reliable for like a month or something like that. We just need to have a system work until they fix something or if they fix everything yeah so and there will be it will be uh, it will be great if the device or can and be moved around it don't have to be stable don't have to be large and you don't really and it will be nice that you don't really need to know or actually have a lot of experience or actually and a lot of knowledge of it and well if you provide like a uh, location base or actually you um, it can actually guide you that would be great so we go through the mode because as a, a research assistant, my job is to go through everything, know where, uh, do, do the reference track and see whether what is going on now, right now and what we, option do we have. So we have like, uh, we pick a lot and actually do some homework on it. So there's like Arden, that's a good thing. Uh, that's a good project. And it's like a Wi-Fi net, high, high bandwidth network. And then there's like a radio, uh, more like a radio type of thing. So mesh testing, a part of our, I won't go through everything, but a radio kind of thing. So there's like two, like the Wi-Fi like category actually provides like high bandwidth, but it's more power uh, hungry. So it requires more powers to do the things. The radio uh, category is like uh, usually like a longer distance, but the bandwidth is lower. But well, and it's like a portable, you can bring it everywhere. So it's like two different category. So we pick, uh, so we have tried a lot and, and, and at the end, this is the result. We pick Arden and MSTH as a compares. So Arden use like 2.4, well, I mean, this is like technical stuff. So I just let you go through everything. So Arden is like uh, just like your home router uh, Wi-Fi. It runs on 2.4. It's called amateur radio emergency data network, and you don't actually as a end client, you doesn't really need to know how it works. You just have to put, take your phone, take your device, and connect to a white house hotspot as usual. So you don't really need um, extra knowledge to know how it works. And yeah, it can run on battery. It can and actually a lot of people run on, on car batteries. To, yeah, and then just throw the nose in the mountains for some reason, and it can provide uh, like kilometer range about uh, about a few kilometer range, depends on the equipment. Uh, um, you have high bandwidth, 
and yeah, actually I throw one station on my lab uh, on, on my top of my building and just take another station and just go through all uh, just walk through the and using the, using the internet from my uh, lab to like watch the YouTube. So yeah, and actually you have a pretty good decent uh, document document song how to do all of the th things. So just like that, I put one station on my uh, on my buildings and yeah, kind of work, but. Uh, there's some restriction and actually not everything is uh, good because you relies on like special kind of the uh, chips you don't uh, don't you don't really have a lot of op options and if you want to actually have a good uh, bandwidth and the like range you need to actually calibrate and you have to have a good antenna you have to do uh, uh, pick a spot that actually pretty uh, is high enough and actually a lot of equipment and the price is pretty high. So the router on the on the uh, PVC pipe actually it's like ten six thousand for one device. So yeah, NT. So not yeah, it's well for me it's expensive because I don't really have <laughs> much of uh, we don't have much much of resource. So it's expensive. And then doing and we're doing mass network. We actually have to, you don't you have to have three devices. So you just know. It, just one device can't do anything, and actually the uh, the building the system, the building how we have to it runs on open WRT, and you have to build everything. Although they have document, but it's hard, and because there is it's on amateur radio, it doesn't actually support uh, the encrypted encrypted and encrypted message or yeah, and there is some NCC laws and other issues. So Arden Arden is great, and but it's not for everyone, yeah, because it's. Uh, it's hard to do. Another thing is mesh testing, and mesh testing is actually uh, things we have. We are actually run, uh, we have a lot of experience on it, and it's pretty fun. It's a low bandwidth, long range, uh, open source uh, project. It runs on LoRa P2P, so yeah, and every node can be a relay station. It runs on 923 megahertz in Taiwan. is is on IS, ISM band, so it doesn't really require a radio license. It's pretty low power, so the device I, we made is like 22 mAh. Yeah, so it, one battery can run like uh, a few days. I mean, even and yeah, you can use solar panels and. Yeah. And you can reach like kilo, uh, a few kilometers uh, range, uh, communication range. It's light. It's uh, it's small, and yeah, you can uh, the message can be encrypted. You ha you can put GPS on it, and well, it connect to uh, the. You can't actually type things on it, so you have to use your uh, phones to do communication. So yeah, so it works like this. It just like. Uh, uh, like regu regular ham radio, so you still need to set uh, the uh, right frequency and channels between each others, and they use uh, your phones to as as a, a user interface. And yeah, so you can just send uh, taxes and like location points and maybe waypoints, and it works like your uh, use, uh, the combination or actually just like a, a Facebook chat or Messenger or maybe Line, it's just the chat room. It doesn't have a lot of. You, you can't send image. You can't send videos. You can't even send like voice or data. But it, it's pretty low when with. But uh, sending text message uh, and location data will actually helps a lot when the, the disaster happens. And the things that uh, as I mentioned before is uh, every node can be a relay station. So uh, our message can actually jump through device. So maybe we don't have like direct uh, connection between like the first one and the last one, but once uh, as long as there's a, a nodes between them and the message actually will uh, relay to uh, well propagate to each other, so you can actually reach a really lot a long range. So this is yeah still my rooftop, and this is, is uh, the bottom uh, the right one is about. Five kilometer, uh, four point, uh, four point five kilometers from our, my lab to the fur, uh, furthest place I can go, and that's just one uh, point to point. So it's just one device. So it didn't it didn't actually relate to anyone yet. I just set uh, set the device on my rooftop and just uh, right, go 
ride my motorcycles and get go everywhere. So, and that's, I can reach like 4.54. And yeah, that's pretty far for one device and it can run just on random battery. But there is still a lot of questions because, well, as I mentioned, uh, the bandwidth is low, so you just can do uh, text and uh, coordinate. And another problem is a uh, technical issue is a lot of product and the, uh, the product you can buy or the processor or even the radio module is made or designed by China. So that's kind of things we don't like. And to actually maintain a, a usable network, you have to have enough uh, actually nodes existing. So rather because if I put just five nodes in Taipei, they're actually just five nodes. It doesn't really connect as a network. So that doesn't really, when there isn't just too small of the uh, number, it doesn't really work. And there is some signal issues. You have to decide, put it on pretty high. And the downside is you can't just go in. We have to have one node or actually have bite the, uh, actually buy the hardware. So, but the good news is it's hard. It's open source. So we make our own. So, and then, yeah, it's open source. The code and hardware, everything, we just design our own. So I just, yeah, it doesn't really matter. So. Uh, just like that, and if they see uh, when the first time doesn't work, you can do another uh, another time. But and in this case, we did it like four times. So this is the version four, and yeah, it works. And yeah, it finally works. And we have a lot of work. We have we we'll go through a lot of things. The good side of uh, when we are uh, and it's, we can do our ver own version is. And we can change every components when we, that's where I have doubt for it and the function, the board, uh, whether it runs on battery, solar panel, everything we can actually just decide by us. And you can use a, a even power efficient com uh, microcontroller. And actually we can just modify to our needs. So there is a lot of weird, weird stuff uh, because actually I don't know how to do the, all of this. So I learned like mo, I haven't, done anything like this before. So that's my first few things, uh, designing PCB, writing, and actually I don't know how to write an RF. I run Arduino and stuff, I don't know how to de develop this. So I just go through YouTube and read a lot of documents and just stare at it and it works. So right now we actually have the V4 version actually just on my site and it works and everything is not made for, uh, we use every component uh, It's not from China and well, it, and the pen uh, is efficient. So it's, and everything is, so the design, uh, the schematic, the PC, the parts, the PCB and everything and the code I wrote, it's on our GitHub page and actually it's merged in the official page. So it, when you go on the official page, you can actually see this type, kind of variant. So, and those, I, I don't, I'm running on low, but so I need a, few minutes, sorry about that. Okay. So it's not like replacing each other. So those kind of tools uh, actually can work together. So yeah, in like uh, like mountain or actually the far, uh, when, when the large range is really long, when, but you can uh, send things or send message through message desk or like radio kind of things. And since uh, when there is a node near uh, the like Arden or actually in the rural area when they need actually higher bandwidth or different, they can actually bridge together so to make the whole uh, network uh, combine together. So yeah, that's not, and all the, of the bit above isn't that important, the important part is here. <laughs> so when this, uh, sorry, about, uh, sorry about time either, if, yeah, and since the, uh, February, because we have to be done uh, doing this project like a few years, but we are keeping, uh, I just, I don't really actually go anywhere and talk about it because there's a lot of weird people when they are dealing with civil tech or actually there's a lot of weird people. So yeah, so we doesn't go, just go everywhere to speak, uh, tell, oh, I have uh, things or no, we don't do that. So until we go to like a uh, uh, V, uh, the summit or actually the Hexthon. So maybe a few people will talk about it, but until uh, uh, this year, uh, February, we, there is someone on the Facebook actually created a Facebook uh, 
page or a group. And people are in uh, interested with those kind of tech technologies. So I'm just being the weird guy. So if you are talk people are talking, I'm just showing, OK, I have done something, and I just post things. And well, I just talk to people I right? start from that. Now, and yeah, people. When we are starting this project, we think that people won't be because when we are talking to like professors and ever some agency, they always tell me, about, "Okay, are you this artist like well developed? And are you are selling things? No, no, we are not doing those. We can't do those. And I don't know how to sell it." And they just told told me, "So okay, when you done uh, developing, and go back to them." So I just don't really talk to them. So. <laughs> But uh, this is pretty different in com uh, community because when this com uh, things actually appears, a lot of people actually bought their own device and just put it on, ma on the balcony or rooftop. And actually, de uh, they designed their own 3D printed case and everything. And actually, they managed to, like, uh, ha so, like, two strangers just arrange a time and date and just do the connection for no reason. I don't know why. So yeah, people are weird, right? So <laughs> yeah, so it starts from like 50 from Mar 50 person in March and about uh, 2,000 people. Well, we have a huge earthquake from April. So every earthquake, every, every other day after the earthquake, the people, uh, the uh, group, uh, the the groups that like, goes up like to 100 people or something like that. So there's a lot of engineer, uh, radio expert, and a lot of the weird people on the those those groups. Sorry, I can't really have that. And so we actually discuss everything, the antenna, frequency, operation, everything. So they have to test, they make their own uh, their version, their uh, own uh, their own version, they're, they're making the own antenna, they're making a piece, uh, actually the solar panel. And this is what we, actually this is yesterday. So every line is, means it's uh, that, the, those points can see each other's, and those lines between is 22 kilometers. Yeah, that's really awesome. They he use a special kind of antenna, but yeah, this is Taiwan right now. So, well, in Taipei there's like 150, so but not very uh, total about 200 in Taiwan. So most of them are in Taipei. So in Taipei you kind if you have a device you can actually go to and f actually talk to people on there. So. With the community, we actually solve a lot of problems. So, and we have, uh, yeah, you used to have the problem that uh, device are all the part of the device is made from China, so there is use Chinese made uh, design components. But we prove that we can actually rule out everything that, like that. And we need a lot of, uh, if there is a government, if it's a project, and we have don't no don't have really have that much money to actually maintain or actually have a lot of points, but. Uh, there's a lot of people really want to just buy the point and put on the balcony for, I'm not sure why, but yeah. And since they are actually enthusiastic about it and they actually will, will actually maintain or even move those points to a actually better place if that, there's not a good connection or not. And we have, uh, we thought to, like, we have to do uh, like educational or workshop to teach up. No, we don't really have to know because if I say something wrong, someone on the Facebook group will actually jumped out and sh uh, and say, "Okay, I'm wrong. Actually, this something is right." So they will actually explain everything to everyone else. So I don't have to do anything. And yeah, that's great. So our goal was to be we are lower the entry point for everyone. So uh, one uh, be, uh, because there is pretty hard to do the hardware and design everything. Yeah, but uh, since I've already done it, so. Yeah, we just release everything, and we we know what the, whatever we have done, what things we have gone through. So we just reduce the things that the need time they need to actually learn everything. So what's next? Uh, so yeah, that's V4. So we have to uh, V V5 version on way. Yeah, and it's smaller, more. Uh, well, it's just upgrade. So and we actually want to put uh, those device on the balloon or maybe drones. Yeah, so because they can go through really high and the coverage will be good. And the antenna is a problem, so we, have, we, are, we are doing to PCB antenna, we are doing solar panel uh, nodes. So yeah, and thanks to uh, actually a lot of weird people on the Facebook group because they actually make these things happen. 
And the rest of it is okay. There's some other issues I don't have answers. So yeah, this system is great. So what's our going to do with it? It's actually just a huge chat group right now. So I don't know what, how it works. And what other scenario can we use it? And um, when the user increase, there's uh, like uh, how to manage every node and actually uh, manage different channels and actually make the, them work together. And although they are actually, in, uh, the message is encrypted, but when, when you're encrypted, but you shared your keys on the, uh, a public place, it doesn't really mean anything. So maybe that's, that's an issue, yeah. And the other thing, uh, that thing is, and image testing is, isn't just in Taiwan. Actually, it, it was used in the uh, whole wide world, uh, world. And actually, I saw one page actually in your presentation. So yeah, we can talk, talk later. And in Taiwan, it doesn't really have the, we have a strict like, uh, uh, censorship uh, in general and things. But in other countries, it actually, it's an issue. And we have run in user groups that have those things we are discussion with that so uh, that's the most important things that's the that yeah, thanks sorry about time yeah thanks yeah uh i, I saw that there's many advantage of the mesh, mesh testing uh over like walkie talkie from from Myanmar. like it's it's not only the redundancy of the communication infrastructure but also the the the, the redundancy of the communication services yeah like in Mazu scenario uh, we are building the redundancy of the infrastructure but we are still using uh, facebook messenger or like lines so yeah how about like, if the line or facebook manager goes down then yeah we, we need like redundancy of the communication master too yeah so yeah i'm not a maker people but i'm very interested in that you can like, just produce that and print a gap zero mark on that, whoa. And I will buy it in our next hex I will song. make it, I will make it. Yeah, yeah, I'm so like, <laughs> eager to have one. <laughs> yeah, just produce it and I, I, I believe everybody will buy one in our next hex song and let's like pray oh, together. Oh, yeah, yeah, and then we will have like 2,000 clients. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, we now, I think we still have like 15 minutes to the, to the QA. And that's, can, we, can you help me? The, uh, yeah, we have the slide now. So the, 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 I, I saw there are several questions about the, about the infrastructure that uh, I think we can do the, the, okay, the first one, the first one. Uh, there are some discussions about, oh, it's, it's still keeping, people just voting, vote, vote, and we were like stuck it to the questions. I saw there are many questions about the redundancy of the communication method that we have. We have telecom telephones. Then why we don't just use like dial-up services in Mazu during the internet shutdowns or internet breaks? Then maybe we can go back to the to the modern and like like PTT uh, dial-up BBS. Is there a is there a solution that you have discovered or you have tried? Uh, no. Um I should probably explain this first. Um, yeah. So when the submarine cables go down, they did not just affect the internet service. It also affect the phone connections for our landline phones and TV signals wow. and um, cell phone services. So, so everything was affected. Oh. Yeah, everything went down. Wow, wow. so we don't have PDT. Yeah. <laughs> no, if either, even you, you find the modems that 20 years ago you used, and you, you won't have PDT yeah. at Mazu. Yeah. OK, and that's take the, the first questions. Uh, how, how the residents of Mazu feel about the, 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 the is, is there any attitude change that uh, when Mazu people when, when facing the, the, the China threaten on, on the seas and the threaten to the, to the industry, to the business, and is there any, the, is this case uh, that the, the, the residents change the attitude to toward China? Or it's like the attitude to, uh, more anger to the government of Taiwan and asking the like asking more uh, of of Taiwan other than like the the China. Well, I would have to say that um, when the incident incur occurred in February, uh, people people were pointing fingers in all directions. So people were angry about having no connection to the internet. People were angry about well. well 
Some people blamed China, some people blamed the government, the central government in Taiwan, <clears throat> some people blamed the local government for not alerting people enough. So <clears throat> it's important to remember, remember that there's a diversity of opinions in Matsu, even though people might have the impression that it's a very KMT-leaning constituency. But remember, well, I received nearly 25% of the vote in Matsu this time. And uh, the Taiwan People's Party received around 20%. The, the KMT received around 50%. So um, there's a growing diversity of voices in these constituencies traditionally considered as deep blue. And uh, so I think, I think the increased international discussions really help people uh, think about topics related to communications resiliency in general. And uh, people are, I don't think the, the blame is put solely on any single party. Mm. Yeah. Okay, I, I have collect, uh, collect some of the reports about Ma Zhu on our share notes beforehand. And there are one articles right by Li Wen on the diplomat that uh, in English that I think that help many countries or our foreign friends understanding the situations and the, and the weaponized of the internet shutdown. That's like maybe it would be like international uh, for, for the international communities to understand the issues so that yeah, you, you can like going back to read those articles or, or you can also help us to spread in that news or that uh, experiments to other, uh, other friends are the foreign friends to make the international communities aware about that issues. And let's see, we have the, the uh, oh yeah, the phone, the phone networks also, the, the, the questions are what about the phone networks on, on Myanmar? Is that also a, a, a solution or a, a chain, a, like solution of the communication on Myanmar too? The dial out internet services, or is there any like similar alternatives? Yeah, I can take that question. So phone uh, networks are also unfortunately affected. And in areas where it is available, the preference actually of the people, the way they use the internet, it's still mobile. So it's also a question of cost and access and preference. So at this point, uh, dial up is almost a non-solution uh, for them. Yeah. And Consider about the redundancy we, 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 we discussed about is like on the infrastructure, on the services, and one of the main, one of the main issue that uh, Shang has told us is uh, on, on the power. If the internet goes down with the power altogether, then the, the solution on Mazu won't work. So you, don't, you don't have power, you don't have stations, you don't have microwaves, you don't have every, anything. So yeah, probably the internet, um, Mobile phone, telecommunication, and power all together, we need like, multiple redundancy and backups uh, on so many different ways, <laughs> different parts. And yeah, let's go in down. Uh, yeah, the, the, the satellite networks, the, the question on the satellite networks, uh, uh, the, the one can you, are, are you able to answer that? The, the questions, the, the third one. Yeah, that, the third, yeah, third question. Taiwanese yeah, government I, now I, asking the, yeah, the satellite company to operate in the company with Taiwanese like funding, like 50% of Taiwanese funding at least. And so that's official official response from the Starlink that, that they are not opening in Taiwan because of that rule. But uh, if, if you have any like... So I'm not going to answer the first question. So, yeah, okay, and, and, and so, so the third question. Um, uh, so Taiwan, the, the Taiwanese government is not against um, foreign satellite networks or companies working with Taiwan, but there's a current legislation that requires a 50%, 50% partnership between a foreign company and a domestic satellite provider. So that was one of the main reasons cited by Starlink uh, for their reason not to enter the Taiwanese market. Um, so so Taiwan, Taiwan's government is engaging with many productive talks with, um, with companies in the UK and in Canada. So I think these, these dialogues are in the correct direction. Yeah, I also asking our friends in Japan that starting is open operation in Japan. I also asking them if there are any similar restrictions on the 50-50% in Japan. And I, I found that the, 
it, it seems that they, they also have the similar restrictions on, on Japan legally. So probably that, that, that could be like, uh, that, that's the problem that can solve. And that's not a hard limit on the Starlink uh, if they want. And yeah, we all heard of like uh, Chin uh, uh, CHT Telecom, China Telecom, and work is, is working with other like low satellite, mid satellite, I mid mean, OB, low OB companies. And probably they will we'll see more besides the one web, and we'll see more more operation coming to Taiwan or even like commercial in, in commercial services because now. We are now able to like buy just buy one web client uh, here and as our backup, right? Yeah, let's see how 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 things will change after the after the new government coming up. Okay, let's see if there are other questions. Uh, we have the top nails and Sean's project, uh, uh, Myanmar. Uh, if cable re ah yeah like the, I think the the cable the cable repair ships let's take that that one if the cable repair ships are expensive to rent and not only expensive but also the time issues you if you rent it now you will wait for like two or three months for them to elder the, arrange the 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 time the slots so uh yeah what what is the upstream uh, to Taiwan simply build building or purchasing our own. Is there any political resistance or the cost issues? Do you know any yeah. so, background? Well, personally, I think this uh, a repair ship would be a very important asset for for national security. Yeah. Um, but since most of the a lot of these um, a lot of the the submarine cables are owned by private companies such as Zhonghua Telecom, mm -hmm. so many of these private companies are used to working with foreign. Um, cable repair ships mm. and uh, signing contracts with them on a on a yearly or a long-term basis so there seems to be some resistance from uh, the private companies actually spending the money um, the really expensive money and uh, maintaining a ship crew for the repair ship and to to invest in one of these repair ships so maybe there could be more policy incentives or more discussions among these companies between the government and private enterprises to actually ensure that Taiwan has our own repair ships. Okay, then uh, I consider for the time, let's find another the last, another questions to be the last one. Uh, can you scroll down more? Uh, cable project funded, uh, cable being privately owned. Uh, yeah. Uh, 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 how are the, I think I, I remember there's the question about uh, mesh, mesh testing to uh, uh, and, and the Myanmar. Oh, yeah. uh, let's let's find that one. one. Yeah, this one. Uh, Shang's project looked like a good match to SS Now's works in Myanmar. Is there any like like uh, chances or any like uh, like uh, that maybe we can cooperate in together or like. A, like shipping some client? I mean, def uh, well, definitely yes, because it's just technology, it's not issue, because it depends on re uh, re how memory works and how you operate on well, a daily basis, or actually what are you going to do? Oh, because the mesh data project is just a it's just a tool. It really depends on how to use it, or actually what's the scenario, what's the restrictions, yeah. whether the like, friction is allowed, or mm -hmm. something like that. But yeah, it's a good tool. Yeah, <laughs> also interesting, in, uh, if, if the SS now uh, are operating any projects to take all the issues, or you are just uh, operating the projects to check in the internet shutdown, or you want to, uh, you are, or are you already running projects to like, tackle in the, 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 the issues, the connecting issues? in Myanmar or in other countries? So for Myanmar, we are talking to the digital rights community to see what tools they are exploring and what kind of support. And I did show in one of my slides a similar tool that they're using, so it would be good to have uh, to carry this conversation further on how they can improve it. And of course, um, Access Now is really making a global call to countries and also to companies uh, to bring in resources to help improve, uh, well, to actually create alternative access to the internet. So that's also part of our earlier campaign in Myanmar. So that's why I was struck with one of the 
uh, our co-presenter and in saying that there's a lot of regulatory issues that arose also from what happened in Matsu, Matsu because in Myanmar, um, all of the telecom companies now are virtually like either owned or directly linked to the military. And so it's very easy also to shut down the internet. So the policy conversation on who owns and controls the network is also very important. And I can see that also emerging from the questions uh, ranging from uh, the cable repair ships and related matters. So I think these are important conversations that have immediate impact uh, on the ground. And so we also thank uh, the organizers for opening this space to start this call also to the community. Yeah, okay. Uh, please help me to uh, switch to the, the slides at the very first. Uh, yeah. yeah, there are some uh, besides mesh, mesh, mesh testing, or if you want to disc, want to try, uh, if you want to try mesh testing, or if you want to work on more projects about the resilience, then we have a monthly uh, resilience tech zone on GAP0, uh, which uh, uh, ne the next one will take part, uh, will take on uh, May 25, just after the new government going up, uh, because uh, we think that maybe we will find it more like a great attack or some challenges from our friendly neighbors to celebrate in the new government. So welcome to join us together on May 25 on the next Digital Resilience Hackathon. And let's work on the, those different projects and to like strengthen our, uh, the whole country, uh, our telecommunication, our daily lives, and yeah, yeah just have fun together. Okay, then thanks uh, Li Wen and Xiang and Goda for coming to the to this station and please like, come to the hack song. And let's let's give a pause to yeah. to the to the speakers today. Okay.